the document whose anniversary we are celebrating was a crucial document and we want to congratulate Canada on having produced a John Humphrey uh, who played, as we have been told, a crucial role in the drafting of this document. For us, it proved significant in inspiring our struggle against the vicious policy of apartheid. It held out an ideal for us to strive after a standard that we would seek to emulate and attain. When we survey our vulnerable earth home, we must be appalled that its soil has been soaked with so much bloodletting and its landscape is littered with hundreds of thousands of the casualties of the abuse of power. And yet we should not be so despondent thinking that tales of woe and gloom are all that characterize this, the last century of the millennium. It would be too one-eyed and negative in the extreme. For there has been another side of the somber picture which we must undoubtedly paint of our times. We have also seen how resilient the human spirit can be as it has triumphed against all kinds of odds. We have seen dictatorships bite the dust and freedom and justice prevail, rising from the ashes of repression and injustice like the proverbial phoenix. Yes, we have had the Holocaust, but we have also had the defeat of Nazism, fascism, and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Freedom has broken out in all kinds of places, even the most unlikely. Yes, we have had the excesses referred to of Pol Pot in Cambodia and injustice and oppression in other places. But we have also seen the end of colonialism and the emergence of new nation states and wonder of wonders. We have thrilled at the end of apartheid in South Africa and the establishment of a new dispensation, democratic, non-racial, and non-sexist in place of what most churches, including the white Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa, have condemned as sinful in and of itself. And, white, and what senior judges in a deposition to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission have denounced as itself a gross violation of human rights. We must celebrate that such a vicious system has been replaced by a constitutional democracy with a bill of rights that is enforceable by the courts and where attempts are being made to cultivate, Chief Justice, a culture of respect for human rights and the rule of law. That is a wonderful... <laughs> that is a wonderful achievement. It is a spectacular victory over the forces of darkness and evil and inhumanity and cruelty. But dear friends, as I have the great privilege of having done in other places, I want to assert as eloquently as I can that victory would have been totally impossible without your love, without your prayers, without your support. We are the beneficiaries of that support. We are deeply indebted to you for making the miracle of April 1994 happen. Therefore, as I have said before, our victory is your victory. <laughs> On behalf of millions of my fellow South Africans, and there are some of them uh, in here, my uh, specialist physician, Professor Benata, just to make sure that I behave myself, is here. Uh, 
on behalf of people such as himself and many others, I have the great privilege of saying to you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mercy, 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 Bobo. It is thanks to you that Nelson Mandela is free today. It is thanks to you, it is thanks to you that we are free in South Africa today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Whilst it is true that the story of our world is not just of unrelieved gloom and despair, we have to be honest and admit that there are far too many conflicts going on. Far too many of God's children still suffer unnecessarily and suffer untold misery and anguish. And most of the conflict is civil conflict or it is internal repression. In Sri Lanka, Northern Ireland, the Middle East, Afghanistan, Rwanda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Bosnia, Kosovo, Cyprus, Turkey, Sierra Leone, the Sudan, Somalia, Burundi, Nigeria, Burma, Angola. These and other countries like them will sooner or later have to deal with the problems of post-conflict, post-repression transition. And how are they going to cope? How are they going to set in place this new culture where there is respect for human rights, where the rule of law obtains? Are there models from which to choose about how to tackle what will be an increasingly common phenomenon, the phenomenon of countries experiencing a transition from repression to democracy, from conflict to peace. The options that are available to these and other countries would be the following. The first and perhaps somewhat instinctive reaction in the post-repression, post-conflict period is wreaking revenge. Those who were the victims seeking to settle scores with the perpetrators who violated their rights in the period now past. This is an atavistic throwback to an earlier period in our evolution as human beings, when the laws of the jungle held sway, survival of the fittest. In order to survive, one had to dispatch one's enemies or negotiate as soon as possible and as effectively as possible if one did not want to run the risk of being wiped out. That is what happened in Rwanda. The Tutsis returned after 30 years to settle scores with their Hutu compatriots for the outrages and violations they had suffered during the three previous decades. The sectarian strife in Northern Ireland is fueled by attack and counter-attack between Roman Catholics and Protestants, between those who claim to be fellow Christians, between those who claim to be fellow Ulster citizens. This option holds out no prospect whatsoever of peace and stability but it is a sure recipe for ongoing violence and bloodletting, each new incident on one side being the provocation of a reprisal from the other, which in its turn provokes its own counter-reprisal ad nauseum. It was an option that we considered in South Africa. On the day following our handing over of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report to President Mandela. We were at a banquet hosted by the Johannesburg Press Club. And one of those who spoke there was someone called Saki Matozoma. He had, as a youth, been jailed on Robben Island, the 
maximum security prison in which Nelson Mandela and others had been incarcerated. He told the banquet audience that many of his youthful contemporaries on the island used to dream of the day when they too would be prison warders to pay back to the jail warders what they had been made to endure in their time on the island. Mercifully for us, this is an option that was rejected and Saki Matozoma did not become a prison warder, but today heads up the parastatal transnet responsible for our national rail, air and sea transportation network. Another option was the Nuremberg trial option, when the perpetrators of the repressive regime or those involved in the conflict are brought to trial. It was possible for this to happen after World War II because the Allies had inflicted a comprehensive defeat on the Nazis and their allies. So they were able to apply so-called victor's justice. The judges and prosecutors after the trial were able to pack their bags and return to their respective homes. We in South Africa were unable to consider this as a real and viable option. There was no clear winner, no clear loser. The apartheid government did not defeat the liberation movements and they, in their turn, had not succeeded to topple the apartheid regime. There was a military stalemate. This option was unacceptable for other compelling reasons as well. The country was not able to afford the time and money resources that would be required to ensure that the judicial process would operate efficiently. As it is, it is laboring under very considerable pressure it would have meant that the country would be mired for a long time in a process in which gruesome and distressing details would be publicized, which would have a traumatic and divisive effect on a fragile and deeply wounded and polarized society. Perhaps the most important reason was that the security establishment, who still controlled the guns, would not have supported the relatively peaceful transition from repression to democratic rule if they knew that they would afterwards run the gauntlet of the judicial process. 